Acts of the Apostles, Chapter 5, The First Sin and the First Deliverance. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, Ananias and Sapphira. By selling his land and laying the money at the apostles' feet, Barnabas had made an impression. That had not been his intention, of course, but Ananias, the name means the Lord's gift, and Sapphira, seeing this, also sold land and brought the proceeds of the sale to the apostles. Unlike Barnabas, they did it because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12, verse 43. Worse, they said the money given to Peter was the whole amount received, when in fact they had kept back part for themselves. In other words, they lied to the Holy Spirit. There was, of course, no requirement for them to bring the money to Peter if they did not wish to do so. Any gift was voluntary, not compulsory. Even great men, or perhaps especially great men, are susceptible to praise and flattery. We all crave praise, but overmuch praise does not gender to humility. Ananias and Sapphira's sin was premeditated. They had agreed together. In Proverbs we read, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Satan had filled their hearts, meaning simply that they had conceived this thing in their heart. Satan had also entered into the heart of Judas, who then betrayed his Lord and died for it. What Ananias and Sapphira had done also amounted to a betrayal of Jesus Christ. They had done the same as Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, who had lied to the Holy Spirit and become a leper as a result in the second of Kings chapter 5 verse 27. Death, though shocking to our humanitarian instincts, was the inevitable result, because he that despiseth, despiseth not man, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. The first of Thessalonians 4 verse 8. Yes, death does seem a severe penalty, but if the sin had been overlooked, there would be no respect for the Lord's appointed apostles in the new ecclesia. Anarchy would have set in at the Ecclesia's very inception. They lied, not just to Peter, but unto God. Like Israel before them, they had rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them, as Isaiah says in chapter 63, verse 10. We cannot lie before God with impunity. But what of Peter? Was he right to use the Holy Spirit power to cause their deaths? Obviously he was, for the Lord had said to his disciples, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. John 20 verse 23. Paul could write later, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. And that was in the first of Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. So Ananias gave up that free spirit, which is life itself that is mentioned in Psalm 51, verse 12. And then it continues, And great Fear came upon all the Ecclesia, and upon all who heard these things. For there never was a more direct confirmation of the truth that the wages of sin is death. It is because sent sentence against an evil work is not normally, we might say, executed speedily, 
that we fail to realise how serious sin is in the sight of God. This is now the second time that fear had been a result of the Apostle's actions. It was the young men who wound him, that is Ananias, up in grave clothes and buried him. The precedent for this had been set when Moses called the young men Mishael and Elzaphan to remove the bodies of Nadab and Abihu from the sanctuary in Leviticus 10 verse 4 to 5. Three hours later, Sapphira came in looking for her husband. It seemed strange that no one had told her what had happened. Perhaps those who might have done so were overcome by shock. When she did appear, Peter gave her opportunity to repent as the Lord allowed, the Lord of Leviticus 5 verse 1. But she, also tempting the Spirit of the Lord, fell down dead straight away. The record deliberately records Peter's words. The feet of them that buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. These feet were surely some of those of which it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10 verse 15 The gospel is our invitation to be in the kingdom. But where one has not put on a wedding garment by living righteously, Responsibly for, responsibility for rejection cannot be avoided. Matthew 22 and Revelation 19 verse 8 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. So ends this strange example of unity in marriage, in sin and in death. It was like Adam and Eve all over again. Let us be honest with God. We cannot have secrets from him who searches the hearts. How much better to pray with David, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's in Psalm 139 verses 23 to 24. Chapter 5, verse 12 to 16, the sequel. As the story got out, many were moved by what was done to hear for themselves the apostles preaching. These marvelled as they saw many acts of healing done by the apostles in Solomon's porch. Solomon's porch was an open portico, a remnant of Solomon's temple, situated along the eastern boundary of the temple area, facing the temple entrance. Again, Luke records that only the apostles did signs. Though by this time the gift of tongues had evidently been given to a larger number of disciples, Brother Thomas suggests that this was to enable those from the Diaspora to preach Christ on their return home. But in any ecclesia, there were only a few who ever received a gift of the Spirit by which they became the spirituals or star angel, the messenger of that ecclesia. We find that in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1 and Revelation 1 verse 20. But why record that they were in Solomon's porch? Evidently, Peter made this porch the focal point of their activities, because here Jesus Christ had been questioned whether he was the Christ or not. Peter and John worked signs and taught here to put the matter beyond doubt. Luke mentions the rest who dared not join the apostles. These were observers who favoured the priests and reported back to them every move. 
Revelation 21 verse 27 and 22 verse 15 tells us that liars cannot be part of the New Jerusalem. We're reminded it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, as Paul says in Hebrews 10 verse 31. Multitudes of men and women did believe, however, and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Sick folk were brought out into the streets in the hope that if just the shadow of Peter would fall on them, as it says in Luke verse 1 verse 35, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, that then the shadow might cause them to be healed. People even brought their sick from surrounding cities, including those vexed with unclean spirits. The word translated vexed means crowded. In other words, some of the sick were afflicted with severe mental illness like legion. Yet these were all healed by disciples who, during Jesus' ministry, had not been able to heal an epileptic boy because of their unbelief. In Matthew 17. Nothing had been seen like this before in Israel's history, except during the Lord's ministry when they laid the sick in the streets, and as many as touched him were made whole. Mark 6 verse, 60, verse 56. Chapter 5, verses 17 to 24, Prison and Deliverance They were dramatic and exciting times. But the Lord had been delivered to Pilate for envy, and envy was consuming the high priest and the Sadducees, who were filled with indignation, in the margin that's put as envy, and laid their hands on all the apostles, and put them in the common prison. There, in the blackness of the night, an angel opened the locked doors of the prison and instructed them to speak in the temple to the people the words of this life. Where more appropriate to speak the wonderful works of God, except that it was where the priests held their corrupt power, Perhaps the freed apostles remembered the words of the psalmist. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which executed judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners, the Lord loveth the righteous. This is from Psalm 146. Verses 5 to 8. So, with no time wasted, early in the morning, at daybreak in the Revised Version, they went into the temple and spoke the words of this life. The word spoken through the apostles has the same power as those spoken by Jesus Christ, who said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life the word of this salvation. At the same time, the council, the Sanhedrin, and senate of the children of Israel assembled to try the prisoners. The senate was a council of elders. The same Greek word for senate is used in the Septuagint translation for judges in Deuteronomy 21 verse 2. The officers reported that the prison security was in order, but that the prisoners had disappeared. The high priest, captain and chief priests were embarrassed, and more so when it was reported that the prisoners were teaching in the temple. Chapter 5, verses 25 to 42. Witness to the Council the captain and officers re-arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. Feelings were obviously running high. The officers were nervous and feared the people, 
as had King Saul so long before in the first of Samuel 15 verse 24. To the officers' reliefs, the apostles submitted to the arrest and went willingly to witness to the leaders of the nation. Before the council, two charges were brought against the apostles. The first charge was disobedience to the council from chapter 4 verse 18. The second charge was that they had accused the rulers of murder, a teaching with which the apostles had filled Jerusalem in fulfilment of the Lord's instruction. In laying the charges, the high priest could not bring himself to pronounce the name Jesus. His hatred was such that he referred to Jesus as this man. There are still Jews who find it difficult to pronounce the name. In answer to the first charge, Peter boldly said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Perhaps it was this statement that aroused the concern that underlies Gamaliel's words, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Peter's statement became stronger when he added, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew. God had not only raised up Jesus as the seed promised to the fathers, but he had also raised him up from the dead. The council had murdered him, and their refusal to be responsible for the act was in contradiction to their cry at Jesus' trial, His blood be on us and on our children. Matthew 23, verse 35, and 27, verse 25. This was not an answer to the second charge, but an irrefutable accusation of the council's complicity in the murder of the Saviour. He is the chief prince, the leader or author of life, as Paul says in Hebrews 12 verse 2 as well. They had forced Pilate's hand so that Jesus had been hung on a tree when Pilate would have set him free. In this action they had cursed Jesus, for cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 to 23. But God, in exalting him to his right hand, unquestionably showed his approval of his Son, as Peter has exclaimed in Acts chapter 2. He is therefore the Saviour to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, something the priests were quite unable to do. This repentance was first to Israel and then to the Gentiles, chapter 11, verse 15, to fulfil Christ's words and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, Luke 24, verse 47. In his Gospel, Luke records that the Lord added, And ye are witnesses of these things. So, in Acts, Luke adds that Peter continued, We are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. As an aside, it is interesting in the light of modern claims to spirit possession that the Spirit was only given to those who had first obeyed the Gospel. It was never given to make a person obedient. The truth of Peter's witness was undeniable, but the Council was not pricked in heart, as were Peter's hearers on the day of Pentecost. They were cut to the heart. Murder was cancelled until Gamaliel, a doctor of the law who was had in reputation, came to the rescue with wise counsel. Gamaliel, his name means reward of ale, was Saul's teacher, we find from Acts 22 verse 3. He was the grandson of the great Hillel 
and a celebrated teacher. Gamaliel was the first of only seven given the title Rabon. It is written in the Talmud, Since Rabon Gamaliel died, the glory of the law has ceased. He was a Pharisee who did believe in resurrection and was respected by all. First, Gamaliel commanded the apostles to be put aside while the council deliberated. Then, knowing his audience well, he appealed to their self-interest, saying, Take heed to yourselves. They had been unable to decide whether John's baptism was from heaven or of men, as in Luke 20, verse 4. Gamaliel left the same question open with regard to the work of the apostles and advised that they refrain from these men, lest they be found to fight against God. In referring to Theudas and Judas of Galilee, Gamaliel avoided the use of the word Messiah. Both men had been slain. Gamaliel was well aware that Jesus had been murdered. He used the same word, slain, that Peter had used in verse 30. How many more murders were they prepared to commit? It would appear that Gamaliel defended the apostles because he wondered about the significance of the signs and was well aware that there had been a miscarriage of justice in Jesus' case. His statement that they may be found to be fighting against God shows that Gamaliel was worried and not too proud to entertain the thought they might be wrong. Remarkably, the Pharisees used the same argument against the Sadducees when supporting Paul's belief in resurrection in 23rd chapter of Acts and verse 9. Having agreed in principle to Gamaliel's proposal to do nothing against the apostles for the time being, the council ignoring Gamaliel's advice to let them alone, called the apostles back, beat them, no doubt with forty stripes save one, as mentioned in Deuteronomy 25 verse 3, and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. To beat a man who was uncondemned was, of course, totally against the law that they professed to uphold. And it was totally against the spirit of that law to beat a man for healing the sick in response to the command to love thy neighbour. Rejoicing in Tribulation The effect upon the disciples, however, was that they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. This is not a reaction that is common to us, but one that has full scriptural endorsement in the Lord's words. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Peter recalled his experience at this time when he encouraged those who suffer similarly, 1 Peter 2, 19 to 20 and in other places. Paul also fellowshipped his sufferings, the sufferings of Jesus, and set us an example of rejoicing in tribulation. Were the disciples cowed by the beating and warning they had received? Not a bit. Daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They surely acted upon the Lord's words. If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24. It takes a rare brand of courage to continue to carry the name into the enemy's camp, even into the temple itself. Let us not be faint-hearted in our preaching. Our Lord has been raised from the dead. What greater incentive to preach could we have? Let us preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. 
for there is a crown of righteousness to be given to those that love his appearing. The first of Timothy 4, verse 2 and verse 8.